Willkommen, bienvenue, and welcome back to Let's Learn the Electric Bass with Light. And today, we're going to be talking about my favorite topic in all of learning. And granted, it's two topics in one, but we should get right on into it, because now we know our major scale, and we're going to review it real quick. We're going to use numbers for our fingers, a one, a two, a three, and a four. So when doing our major scale for just one octave, we'll get into larger scales later, but for just one octave, you find a place to start with number two, and then four, and then one, two, four, and then one, three, four. One, two, or two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four. Hopefully you've got that pattern in your brain meets. And if you don't, we just reviewed it so it's there now. But it brings up an interesting topic. What does it mean for it to be in your brain meets? I mean, what does even... How do you even talk about how you remember things? Because very often people are like, well, you remember it or you don't. Yes and no, because sometimes you remember it easily, and other times it takes a little bit to come to you, and other times it's stuck on the tip of your tongue. And that applies to physical things, stuff that you're just trying to remember, all sorts of stuff. And, well, the best way I've heard it put was talked about by Robert Bjork in the Journal of Applied Psychology. And what he puts forth is a two-factor system two factors. There's the retrieval strength. How easy is it for you to bring it out of your brain? So for me, it's fairly easy to do two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four. It's fairly easy right now because I've practiced it quite a bit recently and it's not the first time I've learned it. And there are all sorts of factors that go into me not having too much trouble remembering that pattern. But there's the second factor, the storage strength. So retrieval strength is very easy to understand. It's how easily you can pull it out of your brain. Storage strength is a whole other thing because people think it's in your brain or it's not. It's not some gradient, not some fine grain, wibbly wobbly system. Well, it's pretty wobbly. Because the storage strength that he talks about is how slowly your retrieval strength fades over time, which is really the goal of learning. It's not that you want to be able to recall it, it's that you want to still be able to recall it later. You follow? And so what we need to do is focus on improving our storage strength such that we don't have to worry about reviewing all the time. So think about something that you haven't had to review in quite some time. Whether it's your phone number, which with cell phones now, who knows if you even remember it, riding a bike, unlocking a door. Well, you review unlocking a door all the time. Every time you unlock a door, you're reviewing how to unlock a door. So is there anything that you know that you can do right now that you have not done for six months? You got something? Because... I am certain there are things that you have not done in six months that you could probably do. I have not done laundry in six months because my wife always does the laundry. Not because I make her, but because she does it to escape the other things that she does. So I haven't done it in at least six months, but I still remember how to do it because I did it for years before we got married. Now, I didn't do it every day. I didn't do it every 15 minutes. But I did do it at least once a week. So that's a nice clean review. Increases my storage strength. So now I can go a long, long time without forgetting how to do the laundry. Well, there are other things that you're like, but I haven't learned about uh, in a long time. Why can I still remember it? Well, you might have thought about it since then, and every time you think about something, that's a review 
And every time you review something, your storage strength increases. And that's the fundamental of this theory, is that every time you take your retrieval strength from something lower to a higher point, that increases your storage strength by some amount. But the real beauty is that the more you increase your retrieval strength by, the more you increase your storage strength by. Whoa. That's the part that you need to demonstrate using science. And our good friend Robert Bjork has done that. Because it's not always clear that the amount you improve your retrieval by should influence the storage. Because most people have crammed at some point in their life. They were just like, I need to memorize this. I need to do it. So I'm going to learn this scale. And they just keep doing it over and over and over and over. Well, every time you do it, sure, you're improving your retrieval strength a tiny little bit. And you're getting it under fi your fingers. You are learning. You're getting it. But by the time you can do it, you've used a lot of time to get there. Because you've had to repeat it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And each time you only improved it by a little bit. And each time you improve your retrieval of it by a tiny bit, you only increase your storage power of it by a little bit. So when you're done, doo -doo 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 -doo, oh, I can totally do it. And then you put it away and you come back and you can't do it anymore. Well, because your storage strength didn't get very high because you just kept cramming away at it. Whereas if you practiced it a little bit and then put it away and then come back, you would be just as bad at it the next day as if you had crammed it and then forgotten it. And oddly enough, that's good for you. Because then you're starting back from zero. And then you learn it again. You've taken your retrieval strength from nothing to something, which is a fairly large change in a lot of cases. And then you put it away. You forget it again. You come back to it, you're like, oh, I can't. I can't do it. Okay. And then you practice it a little bit. And you can do it again. And you put it away for even longer. You forget it again. And then when you learn it, you take it from nothing to something. And every time you increase the storage strength, and it will take longer before you'll forget it completely again. That's known as the spacing effect. Now, people will argue as to whether it should be equal spacing or extended spacing each time, but the research of Robert Bjork has pointed towards extending the space every time. Because then you take more time to forget it because your storage strength has increased, but it's really hard to know how long you should take. So it's a hit or miss sort of thing, but it gives you a guideline as to what you should do. You should have more space between each practice because time is the easiest way to forget things. I didn't say it's the only way to forget things, mind you. It's the easiest because you don't have to do anything. You literally do nothing and you're actually working towards your goal. The reason I say not only is because in the paper that introduced me to Robert Bjork, he was talking about a particular way of causing forgetting to occur, such that you can get your retrieval strength artificially lower, such that when you review it again, you get a larger increase in the storage power. That is amazing. So how do we do it? Well, it's very similar to the encoding variability that we talked about last time with the uh, versus. They're very similar. They focus on different things. 
and they wipe away the extra noise because it gets you to the fundamental of these notes in these in this order well what robert bjork talks about is retrieval induced forgetting so every time you review something that is really similar to something else it causes you to forget that something else at least a little bit now you're going like come on like no no there no there is no way reviewing something similar makes you forget the other things it helps reinforce the other things because it's similar well let me do a little thought experiment for you imagine i told you a cat is a fruit what no no cats are not fruit ah uh, but now it's in your head that cats are fruit. You don't believe it. But that little nugget is now in your brain. And every time someone asks you, what, just name a fruit, you got a small chance of saying cat. It's a very small chance, mind you. But since it's the most recent thing that you've been taught is a fruit, it's trying to get rid of all of those other fruits that you know. But that's not really what you want your brain to be doing. Instead, you then go and have a fruit salad. Have some apples, some grapes, some pineapples, some cherries. All sorts of fruits are in that fruit salad, and each one of them is reminding you the cat is not a fruit. And you want that to be an active process. You don't want to have to waste hours, if not days of your life, forgetting the cat is a fruit. You want your brain to be working for you, and every time you see a fruit, it works against all those other things that are really not fruit. And that's the essence of retrieval-induced forgetting. It's an active process in your brain to get rid of stupid, useless information. But you can use it to your advantage. So we've learned this major scale. Now we want to forget that major scale, such that we can learn it again better. So yes, we could do rhythmic variations, but they're better at sweeping away noise than they are at making you forget that. Because what you have here is a sequence of fingers. So if you want to forget, two, four, one, or yeah, two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four, we'll just come up with a slightly different scale. So instead of doing that, do two, four, one, three, four, one, three, four. And oddly enough, that one has a name. That's the Lydian mode. Now, every time you put that third finger down, that's contradicting your major scale. Just a little bit. And the more used to the Lydian mode you get, the less you want to play the major. Or, let's go a slightly different way. Say... Instead of that, or instead of 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, 1, 3, 4, we do 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 4. That one is the Mixolydian mode, really popular in jazz. So two, four, one, two, four, one, two, four. So we got the major, we got the Lydian, we got the Mixolydian. Each time you play the Lydian, each time you play the Mixolydian, they're working against each other. So each time you play This two up here, instead of this three, you're contradicting the major and the Lydian. And you can keep doing this, where you take one note here and there, make it a little bit different, and it causes all sorts of interesting things, because you could, Instead of having this major third here, 
we could have a minor third there. So we keep that minor seventh from the Mixolydian. Now there's a little bit of a shift in there, so it's a little more difficult, which is also a good thing because your major scale sits right in one place. The moment you add a shift, ooh, it's a little different. Makes you not want to just stay still. So we have one, three, four, one, three, shift, one, two, four. It's very similar to the Mixolydian, but it's got the minor third instead. Also very popular in jazz, the Dorian mode. So you're like, okay, so, so wow. We, we got the major, we got the Lydian, we got the Mixolydian, we got the Dorian. How am I supposed to remember all these weird Greek names? They're all Greek to me. Same way you do anything else. You hear it enough times, it'll just sink in. But also, they've got similar names to one another. So every time you talk about the Lydian, you're kind of forgetting a little bit about the Mixolydian. It's got a very similar name, doesn't it? Well, the major scale, is the Ionian mode. It's got more than one name. Another little variant to help you forget everything else that's going on. Ionian mode. So you've got the Ionian and Dorian. Oof. What else can we add to this? Well, maybe the Aeolian. So it's another minor one. So we have that one, three, four, instead of two, four, one. And then do it again. And then we've got that good old flat seven from the Mixolydian and the Dorian. And then we go up to the octave. That one's back to not moving anymore. Our good friend, the Aeolian, Greek for wind, I think. I don't know, but it's Aeolian. Yet another thing that is ever so slightly different. But this one, in Western music terms, outside of the Middle Ages, is called the natural minor scale. And I say natural minor because there are several minor scales, which are similar to, but legally distinct from, the Aeolian mode. There are two more. There's the Phrygian, which is all those minor intervals that we did last time. So instead of doing one, two, or one, three, four, you do one, two, four. So minor second, minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, minor sixth, minor seventh, octave. So that's the Phrygian mode. That one, the name doesn't sound similar to any of the rest for odd, some odd reason, but I like it the most because of that little at the bottom. The last one I'm not going to show you because it's very rarely used and we'll come back to it later because it has a very specific context and it's different enough from each of those that it's not going to help you forget them. That's the Locrian. It doesn't have a perfect fifth in it. It's got the tritone. And so it's only suitable for very specific circumstances that we haven't gotten to yet. And so, 20 minutes in, 
that's what we need to do to help ourselves forget, to help ourselves learn. And if you still need more convincing about the accelerated relearning after forgetting, just think about any time that you took away from riding a bike and tried to pick it up again. Sure, you're not perfect on a bike right when you get back on it, but man, do you pick it up quick. So that is the accelerated relearning that happens after forgetting, and you can use things other than time to make it happen. In particular, doing things that are very similar. And so in our case, we've got ourselves a major scale and a lot of things similar. The Lydian mode. The Mixolydian mode. My goodness, there are a lot of them that I'm going to have to play for you. So we've got our Dorian mode. And then from the Dorian, we go to the Aeolian. And then from the Aeolian, we go to the Phrygian. And then from the Phrygian, we would go to the Locrian, but it's weird. We'll come back to it. And so those names again, Ionian for the major. Ooh, that was real bad. Ionian for major. Lydian adds the, uh, the three instead of the two on that second bit. The Mixolydian has the two instead of the three in the last bit. The Dorian makes it minor. The Aeolian keeps it minor. And then the Phrygian has that nice half step at the bottom. Now, those are lots of scales to help you forget all of your other scales and they will come in handy. There are lots of interesting places that you can use them. And if you can do all of them all over the instrument, you'll be better at just the ones that you think you're going to need. And then you'll have a few extra things in your arsenal to make people go, ooh, what was that? And that's really our goal. But that's all I've got for this episode on retrieval-induced forgetting and good old-fashioned church modes. I will see you in the next episode of Let's Learn the Electric Bass with Light. <laughs>